Hallelujah. One more time, you are specially welcome to God's presence, and I believe the God whom you have come to seek or meet will surely meet with you at the point of your needs in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. January, February, March, April, May, June, now July. It's awesome. The same road we plied, many plied, they never returned. The same food we ate, some people ate, and that was the end. The same way, the same road we passed. We passed through the road, and you see, that was the end of some people. The same robot you passed through has claimed some lives. People hear evil news every day, but that has, been, that has not been our portion. People cry every day in the world. Every day we will cry for one bad thing or the other. Every day. Virtually every day there's accident in South Africa. But here you are. It's as if something is carrying you. It's all by the mercy of God. Amen. We drive as if we are smart. It's because God is protecting us. Amen. Hey, thank God though. It's, some people, they couldn't have the opportunity to say thank God. Next thing is, they see themselves in air fire or heaven. But here we are today. We are alive. We can even laugh because God has made us laugh. Give Jesus a beginning of praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, enough is enough. Part 5A. This morning, a practical end shall come to every unwanted situation. Amen. Say your loudest amen. amen. The Bible says, above all, taking the shield of faith. Where we you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. Above all, taking the shield of faith. But faith is not faith until it has brought about a change. Faith is not faith until it has brought about a change. Why? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. That is what makes faith faith is when the change is established. Where is it established? In the realm of the spirit. Now, blessed be God of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Ephesians 1 3. So, faith is faith. When it has brought about the change, but it might not be the physical change, but the spiritual way of sin. Then the Bible says, let the weak say I'm strong. Yes, you are weak inside, but you are strong. You are weak outside, you are strong inside. And the internal strength gives birth to external power. So faith is not faith, and it has brought about a change. So ask yourself, the challenge you are going through right now, can you see the change in the realm of the spirit? Can you experience it? Can you picture it? Can you conceptualize it? Can you package it in your mind, in your spirit? That is what they call faith. Glory to God. Hallelujah. A man came to my office yesterday in the evening from Swaziland with crutches, with excruciating pain. Even with crutches, he was going through excruciating pain. And by the grace of God, I just, by privilege, I just laid my hand on his shoulder and prayed. By the time I fi we finished prayers, I didn't want to say you stand up. I said, try to just do what you can do. He just stood on himself. I said, walking. I said, walking. I said, walking. And I said, Papa, how far with the pain? He said, the pain from here has gone. <sighs> Thank God. If the pain from here has gone, which means the pain from here downward can also go. And we prayed again, second time, by the grace of God. And we prayed again, he said, ah. The pain has reduced. And this man, you know, by the grace of God, did not use the crutches back home. Yeah. By the grace of God. Now, what I'm trying to establish is this. The pain totally disappeared. But you see, what brings about a change is the faith you initiate. The faith you initiate is what brings a change. I was really surprised when the man stood up himself. I was really surprised. You see, 
Miracles are never, I mean, they are never commonized in my eyes. I don't commonize the answer. So. Ah, not and so. Anything I see that is unique, I say, ah, this is God. The reason why many don't have testimonies against because God is so common to them. They commonize their breath. They commonize their eating. They commonize their thinking. They commonize everything. As a result, nothing is special again to them. But faith is what brings about the unique changes. I remember by the grace of God, we've been talking about some special brand, brand of wine that can provoke some dangerous realm of faith in us. That can provoke some radicals, you know, kind of faith in us. And this morning, by the grace of God, we're focusing on the passion wine. The passion wine. Remember, we spoke about the, the place of passion, I mean, wine, getting us intoxicated to doing what we are not even intending to do. And remember, if what you don't want is what is around you, you don't watch. And if you will not watch, then you must react. But if you must react, something must generate the reaction. That is the reason for the place of the wine. Getting us intoxicated for the reaction that will bring about a change of position. Glory to God. Hallelujah. In the journey of destiny, your passion determines your portion. In the journey of destiny, to become a medical doctor, you must be passionate for reading. You must be passionate for reading. To become a lawyer, you must be passionate for studies. If you don't like reading, you can't become a lawyer. You can only end up as an artist. You don't need to read to study. You don't need to read to, read to draw. Look and draw. That's all. You don't need to study to, to, to I mean, to, to draw. As it were. I mean, layman drawing. But you must study to be a lawyer. You must read books and books and books and books. You must study to be a doctor. You don't read one and say, yeah, I'm not a doctor. No. You write, they cancel it. You write, they cancel it. Hence, something must push you. There's passion that is driving you. There's something pushing you. And that's the reason why you get connected. In the same way, the passion wine provokes some reaction in us. Makes us to misbehave to situations that must change. Like I said, in the journey of destiny, your passion determines your portion. Your passion determines your portion. If you look at it very well, Jesus said, the zeal of the house has eaten me up. John chapter 2 verse 17. The zeal of thy house has eaten me up. Which means, I am now living on what is eating me. I am now riding on what is driving me. What? Hear this. When a soldier ant, I remember there was a time in the school I was privileged to finish from. There was a time there was what they call a uh, strike here. They call it a looter in Nigeria. There was a looter breakout. So, lecturer, I mean, students were fighting and stuff like that. So, at a point, the VC, our vice teacher was then, one wonderful professor like that. He said, shoot that sight. Shoot that sight. As in, he gave the mobile police instruction. Shoot that sight. So, and you know, it was a terrible day. We'll never forget September 30, 2002. Now, as we were, we were running and running and running. Everybody was running for, for you know, for, for his life. Because now, Poo, pa, it's like a war. Seriously speaking. And as we're running. So at the point, I entered a particular place where soldier ants were. Ah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. If soldier ant holds you for five seconds, 
You know what they call Palongo? <laughs> you will dance what they call Palongo. <laughs> As he did, if they use their proposes or whatever to hit you like this, you no matter how huge you are, you will change direction. <laughs> you, you will know that, I know, no matter how small they are, they are big. Now, hear this. When they put their whatever, the proposes whatever into you, they control you. You are no more in control again. You, ah, yeah, ah, yeah. Now, it's because they are controlling you. That is the zeal of ant as eating me. I'm driving at the point. Now, they've injected control inside you. Jesus said, the zeal of your house has eaten me. That is, I'm no more under the control of myself. I am now under the control of the injection of what has eaten me. So, I don't do what I like. I do what is injected. That's the meaning. The zeal, it is not what I want to do. But I cannot but just do it. It has eaten me there by controlling my life. So, passion is a kind of compulsion. Towards an action. You don't need to like it. Something has entered you to push you to doing it. And as a result, you get, you know, intoxicated. Now, apply that to your life situation. When you look at your life, nothing is getting better. You look at yourself, nothing is moving. Let the passion of what is written concerning you, each up. I am not supposed to be a beggar. Why am I still borrowing for the past five years? I'm not supposed to be under. I'm supposed to be above. It is written. Thou shall be above only and not beneath. But in your family, you're always under. Even you are the firstborn. There's no way you go. You're always a slave. Why, Lord? When the passion of the revelation eats you, that uh, uh, God, it is not normal. Those who don't even know God, they don't beg. Now, I carry Bible, I'm still a beggar. Now, something should eat you. Something should hit you and get you angry with where you are. However, we need to define our passion in order to get the direction. Peter demonstrated unusual passion for Christ. Thereby, he became a unique individual all through scriptures. John 21 verse 15. Jesus spoke to Peter and says, so when they had dined, says Simon Peter, Simon son of Jonas, Love has done me the more than this. And he said, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He said, Feed my lamb. Now, remember I said, the, the, revel, I mean, the revelation of the passion that enters our system provokes our reaction. Jesus was asking, Do you love me more than this? Now, his passion for what he understood about Jesus was what was pushing him. What have you understood about scriptures in your life? What have you understood about Christ in your life? What have you understood about your position with Jesus? He said, do you love me more than this? He said, Lord, you know I love you more than this. Feed my lamb. Second time, do you love me more than this? He said, you know, Lord, ah, I love more than this. Feed my lamb. Now lastly, the third time he asked, do you love more than this? He said, yes, Lord, you know. But why are you asking? But you know. Feed my sheep. And if you look at Matthew chapter 26, from verse 57 to 58, when everybody got deserted, when everybody deserted and left Jesus, Peter followed afar off. When others have left, Peter followed him afar off. Verse 58. 
When others have left, Peter still followed. Why? We could see the trace of passion for Jesus. We could see the exhibition of the passion for him. I like us know that you cannot be passionate and not be desperate. When you are passionate, you don't need to explain your desperation. It emanates automatically. It gets, you know, it smells, it flows. I am passionate for Jesus. Eh, eh, it will show. I love you, Lord. It will show. God spoke to me yesterday. He said, your, your real worship, I mean, your genuine worship is your service. And your genuine service is your worship. Your true service is your worship. But understand, worship is not that I love you, Lord. But the one that has acceptability in God's hand, the one that is genuine and sincere, when you are desperate, a change is about to be born. But you have to be passionate to be desperate. You have to be desperate to give back to a change. This morning, I see God baptizing us with the passion wine for a supernatural change in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And what is desperation? Desperation is a show of compulsion for an action. That I must see a change. Because this is what I've seen. And it cannot change until I, until, I mean, it cannot, I can't stop until I see the change. Hear this. Peter was com committed to Jesus. He followed the father off. Paul was so passionate for God and for Christ. To the point whereby he said, if I preach not the gospel, woe unto me. He, that is, he placed himself under a curse if he doesn't preach the gospel. He was so passionate that he said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Philippians 1.21, 1 Corinthians 9.16. He said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. That is, he placed himself under a curse if he doesn't go out for Jesus. If we allow the passion of Jesus to run inside us, we have a portion with Jesus. If we allow the passion for the kingdom to run inside us, we have a portion in Jesus. I like you to ask yourself, where is my passion taken from? Or what is my passion in life? What is running inside me? Hear this? I like us to know. If you have passion for cloth, your wardrobe will be full. If you have passion for shoes, they can count 500 shoes in your room. If you have passion for books, your library may be the largest in your family. If you have passion for souls, you can't sleep on this. You see souls saved. If you have passion for Jesus, the heaven is yours. Where your passion is, that means where your passion is. What you have passion for, the term means what you have been created for. So ask yourself, what is my passion? Where is my passion? Some of us, when we hear evangelism, say, Pastor, you have come again, forget that one. You can't have passion with the blessings of redemption. In the context of salvation of souls. Because the Bible says, go into the world and preach the gospel. And when you hear it, say, Pastor, leave that alone. Let me go and look for a job. Which means God is not making sense. Please desire a passion that is of Christ, that will make you matter by Christ. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I say, Glory to God. Hallelujah. Even at the point of death, Paul would not withdraw. That was how addicted he was with Jesus. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me. Neither can I myself dear unto myself, so that I may finish my course with joy, which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace. Now, Romans 8 at 5 to 38. He said, What shall separate from the law of Christ? Is it peril? Is it famine? Is it death? 
He said, in all these things, I am more than a conqueror. Please be a God lover. <clears throat> I have passion for his word. I have passion for souls. I have passion for revelation. We have had some testimonies here. That woman that shared the testimony of a new brain, sincerely, what brought the brain was revelation. That man that shared the testimony of the leg that grew out of her daughter is a revelation. How? Colossians 1.16. I just sat down in my room in the night studying and God spoke to me. He said, you are a co-creator. He said, everything was made for him and by him. And he said, him lives inside me, which means I can recreate anything. That was what God told me. Direct. And I'm seeing the results direct. He said, you can create and recreate. Because everything was created by him and for him. And that him lives in, live inside you. Which means with him in you, you can do anything. If you don't have passion for the world, you don't have passion with God. If you don't have passion for the world, you don't have passion. And it is that passion that will generate a change of position. Because now, when that passion enters you, you cannot but push to the point of seeing a change. My prayer this morning is that everyone will change levels in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Say a better amen. amen. Say a stronger amen. amen. Say a louder amen. amen. Glory to God. Amen. Remember by privilege some time ago, I made mention that God is launching every winner to realms of millions. And like I shared during the pre-service prayer meeting, that I was, uh, I dedicated a car in the course of the week. I want to believe probably that's the car that is most expensive I've dedicated in this church. The car is 1.5 million. Land Rover Sports. No, Land Rover is the name of the car. And I was sharing numerously with some of the people around me that the last time I entered that kind of car was when I was where I was. Sincerely, when I entered the car, that in Masaja. He might sound funny, but is he everywhere? Uh, okay, laugh. <clears throat> as in, as I was driving the car, it was massaging my thigh, my back. I said, ah, oh, my, hey. The last time I got that kind of massage was when I flew Emirates to US. I mean, uh, yes, to India. I said, ah, mm, oh, 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 oh. ah, I said, Jesus, money is good, oh, poverty is bad, oh. Now, you are forced to laugh because it's good. If it's bad, you will not laugh. Man, I said, what? The steering is as, as, as soft as a rubber. You know when you turn like this, ah, I said, ah, he. Before I did get the car, I had to drive it around. Ah. Yes, because what is good is good. Yes. And I told the person, I said, ah. He said, how come? He said, Pastor, you said it that we become millionaires. Ah, I said, okay. The husband man that labored <laughs> must be the what? <laughs> so I drove it. <laughs> now, I want you to understand. If you choose to believe whoever God sent to you, you'll be a partaker of the blessing he sent. Yes. But if you choose to mock it, then you'll be withdrawn from the blessing that is being brought for you. I'm saying this to let you know that sincerely speaking, before the end of this month, many of you will see touch millions. Yeah. God spoke to me on Thursday. I was here doing the evening prayers. Please don't miss those prayers, especially those who are around here. One hour prayer is not too much for your life to change. God spoke to me. I stood here. We we're doing evening prayers, the one hour prayer. And he said, He said, I don't need any permission to bless anybody. Direct voice, not that I perceive. I had. He said, I don't need any permission to bless anybody. Which means God does not need your father's permission to change your story. He does not need your auntie's permission to bless you. I had it. I'm too sure. You know, if I hear, I say I hear. 
If I perceive, I say I perceive. If I think, I say I'm thinking. This is what I had. He said, I don't need any man's permission to bless you. And he said, tell the people that if they will be interested in blessing, in, in, in sponsoring the transport, in showing the horse transport, they will see the blessings. And I told them, stretch their hands. And I prayed. I can tell you a number of persons that shared testimony with me from that Thursday, including me. This month will not end without tangible blessings showing in your life. Yeah. Well, today is a command of no more loss. Say no more loss. No more Say no more loss. No more Say no more loss. No more Say no more loss. There shall be no more loss in your life. Amen. No more loss of lives. Amen. No more loss of properties. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And to validate that something happened recently that one of us was being hijacked. And when she was being hijacked, they took her and I was told, and we came back to church, we prayed. And God spoke to me, gave me a scripture. Joel 2.17. He told me, he said, let the priests and the ministers weep between the porch and let them say, spare the people, O Lord, spare the people and give not the heritage to reproach. Why should they say, where is their God? I stood there and I prayed. And I told the people beside me, I said, nothing will happen to her. I called the kidnappers. And they swore they said, Pastor, I swear nothing will happen to this lady. And, you know, did all that. After that, see, be under covering. That's my own advice. Be under covering. Be under covering. And by the time I declared, I spoke to those guys. They said, Pastor, please call us back in 10 minutes. <laughs> As if they know me before. <laughs> and I said, okay, fine. But you, you have said nothing will happen to her. He said nothing will happen to her. Okay, fine. I said we knew each other before. <laughs> and eventually, I told people beside me, I said, relax, nothing will happen. And in the night, 2 a.m. thereabouts, we got her. And, it's, and we spoke to her. And one of us went to pick her at the police station. And she narrated a story to me that even the, the kidnappers were saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please pray for me. I'm telling you. Uh, yeah. Somebody gone. Telling somebody that they've kidnapped that I'm sorry. Can you imagine that? Please pray for me. I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. With God, no, that was cogged. Hear this. Everyone God sent to you is for your rescue. Sincerely speaking. You believe, you don't believe, is your choice. And he said, they even gave her blankets. That's sorry, you are inside the code. They said, do you want water? After they took the car, when they were going, they gave her 100 rand. When they gave her 100 rand, they said, ah, no, I can't find it again. They said, okay, take another one. They gave her 200 rand. Another one. Now, after they did all that, they said, are you fine? He said, yes. He said, where's my iPad and my phone? She was asking people that had gone. <laughs> now, to cut the long story short, same night, we found the car. Same night, everything, they couldn't take the bag. They were to take ATM. The ATM that has plenty of money, they didn't take it. And they only took the one that has just few money, I mean, some amount of money. What am I saying? This is not church. This is extension of God's place. Where protection is so sure if you are connected. When I was praying for this person here, I said, Lord, she's a tighter. You are a fighter. Here. I, no, no, here. I said, Lord, she is a tighter. You are a fighter. God hears prayers, sir, in this place. God hears prayers. And the kidnappers told her, you are lucky. Because normally we uncuff them and we do all kinds to them. He said, but what? He said, no, my case is different. I'm a winner. Now, I'm saying this to let you know that God is establishing the fact that indeed, there shall be no more loss. Yeah. Indeed, there shall be no more loss. Yeah. Man's losses began at the fall. 
When Adam fell into sin, he fell from grace to grass and became a victim of disgrace. The fall of man was what started the loss that man suffers. Genesis 3, 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife eat themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees. So, every time we fall into sin, we are expected of the devil to lose something. That's why, for those who are um, genuine, genuinely born again, when you commit sin, you feel like you have lost something. When you are genuinely born again, if you lie, you know that something happened to you. Happened to you. If you fornicate by any mistake, in fact, even if you do not do real fornication, if you just lost, something moves you. Ah, what is this? If you are genuine, if you are born again, some people, even if they do, they don't even feel anything. Their mind is dead. Even if they do it and do it and do it, when they wake up again, they say, ah, can I get another girl? Because now, the, 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 ah, ah. You know, the Bible, the Bible calls some conscience dead conscience. As in dead. Now, normally, if you are genuinely born again and you are spirit filled, when you commit any trace of atrocity, you feel you have lost something. That is the connecting factor between you and God. So, man lost everything because of sin. But what is the way out out of this loss? There's no better way than salvation. But I like us to understand that number one, being born again is not just I give my life to Jesus. Being born again is more rooted than the way we think. Some days ago, God showed me a picture. And the picture he showed me, he showed me the picture of a wood. The wood was just, a, I mean, just a, a piece of wood. I said, what is the meaning? And he made me to understand. He said, the wood is just like this. Look, thank God, this our church has a wood pillar. Now, a wood like this that does not have a root can never carry any, 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 any structure. He said many have Bible, but they don't have roots in the Bible. He said that's why they're not standing in life. To have the wood is not what carries the structure. To have the wood that has roots is what carries the building. So it's not all about I'm born again. You're being born again. Can he show for you? Can he speak for you? What is it that you come born again that is showing your life? I like us to know that Christianity these days has been, like we are aware, bastardized. Being born again has been generalized. Are you born again? Yes, I'm born again. You are born again, you are still smoking marijuana. You are anti born against. Now, you cannot, you cannot. Being born again simply means you are. Re re See, I had to tell God, Lord, remember this lady is a titan. Remember, this lady is a soul winner. Remember, Isaiah 14, verse 20, he said, bring forth your strong cause. Produce your strong reason. Bring your reason. Why do you think I should intervene? When you are genuinely born again, you can't be a victim of any loss. So being born again is a fundamental requirement of experiencing no more loss. Glory to God. Because at redemption, we were translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Colossians 1.13. We were translated. So if you are in the midst of light, you can't lose anything. With light, everything lays bare. With light, everything is clear. With light, nothing can be hidden. So, when we are conscious of salvation, when we are conscious of our redemption, we can't be a victim of any loss. So, being saved, for example now, hear this. The Bible says that the thief commit not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Those are forms of losing things. Forms of loss. 
Form. Those are forms. But hear this. He said, but I have come that I may give you life even more abundantly. But who is the I? The Jesus is the salvation we receive. The Jesus is what we receive. So he said, I have come that you may have them, John 10, 10, that you may have them even abundantly. He said, I am come. The eye is Jesus. So whatever you, are, you could have lost before salvation, he said, I will give you abundantly, and when I give you, I will keep it. When I give you, I will keep it. That's why at salvation and redemption, we have restoration and a new beginning. So being born again, and you are losing every day, question your salvation. Being born again, and there's no progress, question your salvation. Being born again, and your life is not balanced, question your salvation. Salvation does not reduce. Salvation only enhances. Salvation does not reduce. Hear this. Many claim salvation, but they are far from it. Because you lie and you don't even feel it. You are not saved. You twist words and you don't even feel it. Saints, I'm saying on this exalted altar, if I mistakenly lie, I will not have rest. I'm telling I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm walking towards it. But if I mistakenly lie, I will not have rest. My mind will be beating. Until I say, sorry, it's a mistake. I'm telling you, until we get to that point, we are not saved. It might be blunt, it's the truth. When we are playing, 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 you know, they call it wisdom. It's a lie. It's, you know, the Bible says there's sensual wisdom, there's um, devilish wisdom, and there's divine wisdom. So when you say, no, it's just wisdom, it's wisdom, you know, if we're not lying, we're just applying wisdom. It's a lie. You're a sinner. So, check yourself. Am I genuinely born again? And number two, be committed to serving God and the interest of his kingdom. During this midweek prayer serv- um, meeting in the course of the week, God spoke to us by privilege. And he made us understand. And he said through me, he gave me, you know, he gave us a better understanding of Exodus 23, 25. Ah, in a very strange way. It might look normal to you if you see it that way, but it's not normal. It says, and ye shall serve the Lord thy God, and ye shall bless. And God spoke to us in that prayer meeting. He said, your service is your job. And when you, when you are in a service, when you are serving, they pay. Which means, if you are practically a soul winner, you are also an employee. I mean, employer. Employee. So, which means God has employed you. He came in a very direct way. Thou shalt serve and he shall bless. Which means your service is your job. The same way God pays, I mean, the same way men pay men, God pays men. But you must see it as your job. See, you're going out every morning as your job. We have read several testimonies of those who allow God to employ them and automatically they became gainful, I mean they had gainful employment. Thou shalt serve and he shall bless. However, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and it hath no loss. Proverbs 10, 22. So understand that when you serve, he will bless. And when he blesses, you are not expected to lose again. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But the question is, am I seven? Are you seven? You can't protect yourself. You can't promote yourself. Why? Psalm 75, verse 5 to 7. Promotion cometh neither from the south, nor east, nor west. But the Lord set that one up and bring it one down. So you cannot promote yourself. God is the one that promotes. So serve the promoter and you get, you get your promotion. Serve the promoter. But mind you, you can struggle to work. You can rigorously engage in work. But only God determines your health. 
You can work and work and become a millionaire. There are millionaires in the grave today. The money could not save them. They lost, they lost their life totally. So understand that when we serve God, He gives us all round blessings. Not one area, but every aspect. Hear this. You are at work. Your children are in school. You don't have power to protect them. You are at work. Your wife is at work. You don't have, you can't be husband in the, in the office. But when you serve, you have a reserve blessing that covers every aspect of your life. When you serve, it promises to preserve. When you serve, it promises to protect. Thou shalt serve, and he shall bless. And it will take away sickness, which means no more loss. It will take away disease, which means no more devourer. He said, the number of your days, I, the Lord, will fulfill. Ah, you know the book of that? Which means, I've ordained 120. Nothing can change it. Where you serve. I have ordained 120. Nobody can take it. I, I got one scripture some time ago that God revealed to me. He said, Hebrews 2 verse 9. Or 2 verse 9 there about. I'm, I'm not too sure. He says, Jesus has tasted death for every man. Ha! Ah. Saints, the Bible you have is not the revelation you have. The scripture you know is not the, yes, 2 9. It's not the revelation you have. Many have Bibles, they don't have the understanding. The scripture you quote is not the revelation you know. He says, Jesus has tested death for every man. Which means the death I will die, he died it. Ah, I was excited. The death I will die, Jesus died it. That's why he said, I give it, my life is hid in Christ, the one who has died for me. My life. So when they hear when you hear death, don't think of somebody around you. When you hear death, don't even imagine it. Because Christ has tested death for every man. Not even believer. Every man. So, when you now understand this revelation, you are exempted from every evil around. Glory to God. From today, there shall be no more loss. There shall be no more loss in the name of Jesus. So, be committed to serving God and the interest of his kingdom. Because serving God and the interest of his kingdom secures our lives from the plagues of losses. Job 36 verse 11. They say if they will obey and serve him. They will live their days. Please analyze this scripture very well. If they will obey and serve. They will live their days. In prosperity. And their years in pleasure. Let's analyze. Their days means day in day out. You are prospering. Year in year out. You are in pleasure. Which means every second and day of your life, there is no reason for breakdown. It is not a prayer point. It is a verdict. If you embrace it, it is a portion. If they will obey and serve, they will live their days, which means every day you live in affluence. Every day you live in unusual realm of prosperity. They will live their days. Hear this? What makes a month is weeks. What makes weeks is days. If you look at it very well, which means every day of your life, you can't say I don't have money. Because God has vowed to bless each day by virtue of your commitment to service. If you will serve, here. Yeah, God has budgeted a blessing for each day. All you need to do, obey and serve. But as you obey, I will give you pastors that will feed you with knowledge and understanding. That when you multiply by obeying the instructions, Jeremiah 3, 15 and 16. So, when you obey the teaching, when you obey the instruction, he said you will now multiply and increase greatly. 
Which means your level will never remain the same. Not by prayer, by action. Not by, just, you just obey. You plug in into it. Saints, every member of Wuna Chapel Pretoria is changing levels. Yeah. If you choose to believe, remember, I can't change you. God can't change you. Your action determines your change. Remember, Newton's law of motion. To every action, third law. Is that to every action, there's equal and opposite reaction. So as you act, God will react. If you don't act, God will watch. My action determines God's reaction. For example, God showed me one revelation some time ago. He said, do this, 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 this. Ah. And as I started doing it now, I could see some changes. Every time you take a step, God has a long leg. When God said take a step, there is a long leg that will promote you to where you never imagined. So you just be ready. God is more than able. From this morning, every trace of loss is over in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. This week, every form of loss that you have had in time past shall be fully recovered in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And the mark of no more loss rests upon you in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so shall it be. Yeah. 